Hello, good morning and welcome. Welcome to the first uh, SDS webinar of 2021. It's the kickoff. Uh, it's been several weeks since we've, we've been talking to, to our clients and we are very, very keen to talk to them again. Joining me is Phil Shelton, CEO of SDS. Uh, and what we're going to do is Phil's going to give us a quick overview of the, the, the company vision for 2021. And then we're going to go to our excellent lineup uh, featuring Alex Rose, director of new homes at Zoopla, giving us a residential overview, uh, followed by Mark Bajent, who is a well-known consultant in development. He's going to be talking zero carbon, uh, as well as a few other things. And then we've got Joe Fallon, the assistant director of Weavervale, who will be discussing uh, the new shared ownership affordable homes program, as well as building safety. So let's, uh, without further ado, go to Phil. Phil, good morning and welcome. Morning, Chris. How are you doing? Great, um, great. Yeah, it's, it's been a good start to the year, hasn't it? It has, yeah. Um, it's it's been a very strange last ten months or so, isn't it? But uh, it's certainly been no less busy. I think for everyone that we speak to is equally just as manic, if not less, because they've got time to sit and have lots of meetings rather than travelling around all over the place as well. But uh, we've um, at SDS we've been doing quite a lot. Um, it was interesting. I was reflecting this morning briefly that it's been twenty years now. I've been working at SDS, and uh, there's been quite a few technology changes, shall we say, over that time um, from Excel to things like Proval LS to the cloud versions of software like HomeMatch. And in terms of where we're going as a business, you know, we're really keen, to obviously, to try and make things as fast and as simple and easy as possible. And so we reach the limitations of what we can do with software in its current format. So we're busy working on transferring all of our software to cloud-based software as a service. What that means is you don't need to worry about your IT departments anymore. You can just log straight on and it will give you a lot more scope and flexibility to kind of meet the needs of housing associations, local authorities, everyone who's developing social housing um, so we can get more built as quickly as possible. Everyone's asking us about the cloud bill and it, yep. it is going to be very important for the company ongoing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, we're, everything will move across to it um, and be a lot more integrated when we're there as well. It's a project that's been ongoing probably for the last five years I, in terms of scoping, specifications, sort of uh, technology testing, all sorts of things we've been working on. And we're now actually, um, it's kind of like getting through a planning permission process. We've been doing that for a long time and now we're actually getting to build something. So we're busy doing that now and uh, we'll be sort of being able to show people that later in the year, what's, how it's coming along. Um, but I mean, we're probably a year to a year, two and a half at the most away from having something fully finished. Um, hopefully sooner than that, but uh, yeah, we're uh, that's quite exciting, and hopefully we'll give people something that's really useful and kind of uh, much more flexible and in what they can do with it and where they can work with it as well. Well, we will be looking at early adopters to start out, and not everyone is suitable to yep. be an early adopter. You have to have some patience. Uh, <laughs> you will get a better price to begin with that will lock in. That's kind of what we're doing on home match. Yeah, no, we've we've had a few people ask to say, yep, absolutely, they're kind of keen to have a look and feed into it. And as soon as we're at a position where we can show you something, which won't be too much longer now, hopefully, then we'll be doing that. We'll be coming out to you and saying, look, this is how you could you can actually see how it's coming together, and so you can see and feed back into that. And we'd be happy to have any any feedback and uh, discussions with people about that. Would be fantastic. Well, I would love to show our our clients and our audience some of the pictures because it looks like. The, it, on a visual level, it is the most yeah. impressive user interface I've seen uh, mm -hmm. in, in, from the company. Uh, so it is a whole new world visually. And yeah, if, if anyone yeah. can can show our clients a peep of that, I think I think that would be great sometime in the future. Yep, we'll be doing absolutely. We'll be working with um, one of the kind of designers on the visual user interface to put together some presentations on how it's going to look and feel, um, which we'll be doing soon. And then later on within the year, we sort of will be able to actually show the software itself in that format as well. So yeah, brilliant. It's, it's on its brilliant. way. Is, but, but bear with there, us. <laughs> we get there as quick as we can. <laughs> yeah. So it's end of this year is what we're aiming on for the early adopter group with a potential rollout for 2022. Would that be correct? Yeah, I was going to say we, we won't be out on general release until 2022, um, but we'll be talking to people through this year as we kind of progress and move it forward so people can actually kind of have some feedback and sort of make sure it's going in the right, you know, we're getting everything included in it that we can for that first release. Obviously, software is always added to and, you know, things get added to it as it never kind of stops being evolved over time. No. But for no that problem. first release where everyone's got something useful, that's where we'll be. 
Really? Well, it's uh, 10 to 5. Thank you so much, Phil. We're going to Sorry. now, uh, we'll see you at the end in the panel uh, discussion. And uh, please, everyone, direct your questions. We'll be here to talk. In the meantime, let's go to Alex. And Alex, I am just going to make you presenter. And good morning, everyone. There you go. Christopher, can you see my? Uh, you see I my can. Screen? I can. Brilliant. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Rose. Uh, if we've not met before, um, I'm a director at Zoopla um, in the new build department um, and have a long history at Home Trek as well. And, and if you've kept a close eye on our businesses, um, Home Trek and Zoopla actually uh, came together about three years ago. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was just give you a bit of market context um, because we're able to piece together sort of what we see happening from a home track point of view. Um, and for those of you unclear, that's tracking social housing, tracking the mortgage market, um, tracking house prices, um, and bring that together um, with what we, what we see on the Zoopla side, which is consumer demand. Uh, what, what are people's search habits and behaviors on our website? How are they interacting with content? So just want to give you an overview of, um, I guess, what we, what we saw in 2020 um, and how that's um, carrying through into 2021. Um, it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop, um, but uh, I'm more than happy for the shares to be, uh, the slides to be shared and distributed by uh, SES after the, after the meeting to any attendees. Um, so without further ado, um, we look at demand um, for last year. Um, if we wind our, our, our minds back 12 months, um, we will recall that we entered 2020 on the back of a, um, a, a pretty clear uh, election uh, result um, and also starts to get a bit more clarity on what, what uh, Brexit might look like for the country. And so we certainly saw some um, demand uh, increase in the early part of 2020 um, and up until uh, kind of late February, um, the, the market showed no sign of um, any any changes to that. Um, but pretty, pretty quickly, almost overnight, um, we went into a lockdown, um, not quite knowing what that meant or how long that would last. Um, I think we certainly didn't anticipate uh, to forward on 12 months and, and be in another, another lockdown. But um, essentially in the first lockdown, if we wind our minds back, the housing market um, closed pretty much for seven weeks. Um, and, and close for business and that obviously had a huge impact on demand during that period. The market reopened on the 13th of May and um, you know that that sort of pent up demand um, and a combination of factors meant that for the remainder of 2020 despite all the various um, kind of openings, reopenings, uh, you know mini lockdowns and um, restrictions, tiers you name it, um, actually demand has continued to be strong for the remainder of 2020. And, um, you know, we, we find that there's no real let up in, the, in that uh, at the beginning of 2021. So demand is as, str as strong today as it was, was 12 months ago. Um, so really interesting. And, and what's driving that demand? Well, as we said, particularly in the first lockdown, there's a lot of pent up, pent up demand. Um, very much concentrated in southern England, um, but but demand then cascaded across across the whole of um, Great Britain. Really, um, firstly, you know why why is this demand come about? Well, we've gone through a sort of once in a life, lifetime reassessment of um, housing demand. Uh, I think we've all had time to reassess our situation around working, commuting, our home life um, in the last last 12 months or so. And so people have thought very differently about their future housing needs and that's created an un unlocked demand in different parts of the market. Um, the government um, also chose to um, try and help kickstart the market in anticipation of some challenges in the uh, latter half of 2020. Um, and so they uh, introduced a stamp duty holiday um, which is obviously at the moment due to run until the end of March. Um, and that's again, driven demand pretty hard. We also had the changes in help to buy, which although they don't technically kick in until uh, March of this year, um, as many of you in development will know, um, or close to it, uh, house builders had to submit um, any applications for help to buy 
um, kind of by by mid December. So we've had that change now, um, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of consumers were moving to buy new homes as, as quickly as possible and take advantage of uh, the first help to buy scheme. Um, in terms of sales for this year, um, you know what, what we saw in 2020 is understandably so. Sales were were down on the long run average of 1.2 million sales per year in the UK. Um, we are running around one to 1.1 million at the moment, and we think that that will continue in 2021, largely driven by supply issues. Um, if you speak to house builders and you you sort of look around developments at the moment. Um, there's very little availability in the new build market um, and in the resale market there's actually uh, much fewer homes coming to market right now I think particularly caused by the third lockdown that we find ourselves in at the moment so new supply to the market is about 12 percent down on 12 months ago um, and when you've got high demand um, and a, a, a lower supply balance um, that obviously creates some issues um, and what does that do? Well, that that pushes house prices. Um, and so, what we can see on the graph on the graph on the left there is that um, house prices are rising at their fastest uh, for three years. Um, and actually, that pressure and that um, that demand has largely been felt outside of London and the southeast. So prices are currently rising fastest in the Midlands, the north of England, and Wales. Um, if we look at who's demanding homes and, and what the trends are, we've um, not unsurprisingly seen a, uh, a greater change in demand um, from, uh, if we look at the CACI demographic group of uh, what we would class as affluent achievers and rising prosperity. So the, the more affluent um, have, uh, have chosen to, uh, to, to act in the situation. Um, and unfortunately, the, the challenge of that, particularly with rising house prices, is those that are more stretched and, and financially adverse are um, essentially pushed out of the sales market at this point. And obviously that creates um, uh, an ever increasing need for affordable tenure options and solutions to help people get onto the ladder. Um, if we look at the homeowners in uh, the, the UK, um, and I'll draw your attention to the pink uh, bars, um, as you can see, uh, largely homeowners um, exist in the 45 plus age category, um, but actually they move less frequently than, than people under 45. So there's an imbalance between, and if I pick on the 45 to 64 grouping there, 40% of, uh, of that age group, um, or, or sorry, that age group makes up 40% of all homeowners in the country, um, but they only move, uh, only make up 23% of moves. And we think that there will be more moves in those um, older age groupings for a number of reasons. I mean, um, partly because of the vac vaccination programs, um, particularly for the 65s and over, um, may allow them to move sooner. Um, but also allow them to perhaps reassess their, their lifestyle and their position. They may choose to unlock equity, um, either for themselves or for a uh, for dependents and, and for their children, uh, so-called bank of mum and dad. They may also choose to move closer to family, um, particularly as we come out of restrictions, um, as uh, hopefully family units uh, look to reunite and get much closer to each other. So. We're expecting more moves in that in that older age grouping, um, and not least for the fact that, um, as I say, uh, for first-time buyers, um, they will find it certainly tougher over the next year or two. Um, if we now sort of start to switch into the rental market a little bit, um, what we're finding there's there's a sort of deinvestment uh, from landlords in the market. Um, partly or, or largely driven by tax changes and um, so it's less less appealing for the sort of second and third homeowners uh, in that um, kind of buy to let space um, and again that's creating some issues on supply for rental properties in the market um, so if we look at what's happening to the uh, demand versus supply imbalance in in the rental market there's a huge imbalance across all areas of the country uh, bar London. Um, so what you can see at the moment and the map on the right 
is that rents in London in 2020 actually uh, dropped 5%, which is highly unusual. Um, that's largely, again, due to people's um, work and travel commitments. Um, and if they don't need to pay a premium rent to live in for the zones one to four, they're probably exercising their uh, their choice and their, their ability to uh, maybe move further out of London and save money on, on rent. So we've seen um, with that demand outside of London that rents have, have been pushed higher yet again, um, which unfortunately, again, creates um, financial issues where uh, wages and savings inflation um, doesn't really support the, uh, the rental growth in those areas, creating some pinch points in the market. Um, so just to sort of summarise on that really, um, our outlook for 2021, we think uh, sales completions will largely be unchanged from 2020, um, but the makeup of those completions will be um, different with uh, more affluent groups, uh, higher house prices, and slightly older demographics moving home um, with challenges in that first time buyer market, and particularly um, those that are not able to uh, afford to purchase outright. Um, house price growth is currently running around 5%. That will slow this year, um, in our view, um, but it will, it will still remain in the positive, um, slowing to around 1% by the end of, end of year subject to any material changes in our circumstances. Um, and as I've said all along, really, the relative scarcity of homes, um, you know, depending on which side of the coin you look, um, they will support pricing um, in the industry um, and support higher house prices. Um, and they support the development program, particularly for the outright house builders, where um, you know, they, they will be confident on their outright programs that they can sell all of the units um, due to the volume of demand. Um, and as I say, I think this this all plays into a, um, you know, a, a much stronger requirement for um, a flexible range of options across all areas of the market um, based on tender and affordability programs. Um, Chris, I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, Thank you. And, uh, oh, just one, one final point, actually. Um, hopefully, if you're interested in a lot of the research that we've got, I would just recommend that you uh, take a visit to advantage.zpg.co.uk where you can enter your email address and sign up to any of our um, any of our insights and monthly market reports. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. That was fantastic. I mean, that's quite a lot of good data there. So uh, thank you very, very much. By the way, if anyone has any questions, please do tell me I'm taking your questions and I can uh, basically put them onto whatever speaker is at the appropriate at the appropriate moment. All right. Okay. So, Alex, uh, you can basically. I'm going to let you go. I, I believe you have something to go to within two minutes. Thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully, we'll see you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. And now, welcome, Mark. Mark, you are a well-known consultant in the industry. We, we've worked with you many of times. Uh, so, thank you so much for for appearing today. And uh, you have some very important things to talk about. Some of the big issues. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, welcome uh, from me as well to everybody. And uh, it's really good to be here. Um, so, I mean, just so people who don't know me have a little background. So I've been doing consultancy for about six years, having previously worked for local authorities in the main. And most of my consultancy work has been with local authorities, setting up local housing companies, doing interim management uh, at senior levels, uh, mostly around development. Uh, but also around uh, regeneration and, and the, the wider housing uh, investment piece. So for me, the, the key issues at the moment are around getting the balance right between different aspects of capital investment. And I think um, if I look back over the last five years, there's been a lot of emphasis on building capacity in local authorities in particular to do new build development. and. Um, I think from a political point of view, from the, the views of elected members, and also from the point of view uh, of board members of housing associations and so on, um, you often see that the new build side of things uh, is, is seen as more exciting, is it's seen as the area to really make the big achievements and, and, uh, and demonstrate what your organisation is about in terms of the numbers that you drive through. Um, I think that is really having to be rethought now. 
I think in the light of um, the Grenfell Tower fire and uh, now the new building safety regulations that are on their way through Parliament, the uh, emphasis now on the existing stock is really coming back into prominence. And you see large uh, housing associations, for example, who are putting huge amounts of money into um, bringing their buildings up to safety standards. And um, so that as a, as a counterweight really to all of the money going into new build, when you look at it from the overall pot of money that you've got to invest in housing, uh, getting that balance right is, is quite a challenge. And then on top of that, coming up, if you like, in, in third place behind, but really accelerating is the zero carbon agenda. And um, so when I look at it, I see a, a, a web of, of interrelationships between these different investment choices. And of course, the smart person is going to try and tick all those boxes and make all those things happen. But there really are trade-offs. There appears there appear to be trade-offs, and there and there really are trade-offs. And it's a question of working those through. So, you know, for example, we we're interested interested in the quality of new buildings. We're in, interested in building safety. We're interested in in maximising efficiency in buildings. Uh, but we also want to get the numbers through quickly. So, how do you how do you make that work when you're managing a particular development scheme or development program? How do you set your employer's requirements so that you're getting the right product through the system uh, that meets all of those requirements now and is sustainable into the long term? Uh, one of the issues with zero carbon that I'd be really interested to hear uh, people's thoughts about is around, um, is the technology ready now to actually roll that out in a way that when we look back in 10 years or 15 years time, will say, yes, we made the right choices, we've rolled out the right technology in our new build, and it's, and it's good for the long term. Or are we going to invest in something now, and then in 10 years' time, there'll be some new technology, and then we start retrofitting all of this new build, uh, or, or saying, well, if only we'd waited a little bit, we could have done a better job. Um, so there are those kinds of issues. Um, similarly, as I say, with, with new build, you've got the, the trade-off, if you like, between design and build in a contract that you're very familiar with, um, but it perhaps doesn't really tick all the boxes in terms of um, some of the wider quality issues that you want to achieve. Or it's about creating a new contract each time, which really gets into what, what quality outcomes you're looking for. Um, so those, those are some of the things that I think um, people are probably struggling with. And I think those, those debates are really important that we work through as a sector and as an industry uh, so that that learning is spread. I think the other key thing to talk about is, is capacity, is training, is expertise. Because as I say, you've got these different things going on. You've got the building safety agenda, you've got the zero carbon agenda, you've got the new build uh, capacity. And how do we make sure we've got enough qualified and, and uh, expert staff to actually give our organisations the capacity to, to deliver on these things? And my concern is that there are people being um, poached and people being, um, you know, pulled in different directions because of, we all need more capacity to deliver all these things. You've got a new regulator coming into being for building safety. Where are they getting all their experts from? My fear is they're taking the best practitioners out of the front line to become the regulators. And there's always that difficulty. Um, we actually need to keep the expertise at the front line. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover was uh, the, the social housing white paper. Uh, with, there's a lot of detail in there, but for me, the, the main drive of that white paper is around involving our residents much more closely in how we deliver all of these aspects. And I think, again, uh, in the past, a lot of resident involvement has been limited to um, local housing management issues, uh, maybe how the repair service is working, but actually getting residents involved in fundamentals around building safety and design and the procurement of new build um, these are things that I think we really need as an industry to do better on. So I'd be really interested again to hear people's thoughts about that. Um, I think probably I've covered the key things I wanted to cover and I'm really happy to, to join in the discussion. You, you, you have, Mark. Thank you so much. And let's go to Joanne. 
and good morning to, to everyone joining us. It's it's a pleasure to be here and thanks so much to, to Alex and Mark for what's been um, a, a really useful start there in terms of highlighting some of the, the key challenges that um, we're, we're all absolutely facing this year. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of expand on that, I suppose, a little bit. Um, I'm really mindful that these challenges will will impact us all um, in, in quite different ways, depending on our, our organisations, where we are and so on. So hopefully by, by sharing my perspective, we can open this up to, to a wider conversation. So I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit about Weaver Vale Housing Trust so you understand where we're coming from. Um, we're based in Cheshire and Warrington. Um, we're a, a, an LSVT organisation that owns just over 6,000 homes. We're actually quite new to development and sales. This is the, the third year of our development programme. Um, we'll be looking to build about 150 homes a year moving forward, so we probably are the, the smaller end of the spectrum. And we are one of the founding members of JV North. So for those of you who, who don't know JV North, we're a homes in England consortium and a procurement consortium um, based primarily in the northwest of England who build around um, four homes um, a day. I just wanted to, to briefly touch on the affordable homes program. Um, obviously we were all waiting the announcement around the new program back in September I think it was with, with bated breath um, and I think, you know, to start with a big positive, you know, £12 billion is a lot of money. And, you know, for, for, for me, I see that representing a huge opportunity for the sector. Um, I appreciate my colleagues in London might have, might have a slightly different view on that, though. Um, but obviously a few challenges and, and a, you know, a couple of curveballs in there as well. Um, I'm just going to try and rattle through some of those. I, I think for me... Um, Obviously, we're not quite back to kind of where we were under a Cameron government, but this government have made it abundantly clear that home ownership is an absolute priority for them. Um, and that feels like quite a challenging moment for me for, for government to be setting their stall out in that regard, given um, what we're going through at the moment with COVID, Brexit, um, and, and you know whether that, that is the right balance in terms of 50% of, of that programme. Our programme is about 30% shared ownership um, at present. So some of the conversations we're having internally are, you know, do, do we look to increase that? Does that feel like the right time to be doing it? And I, I'd really welcome views on that um, when we open this, this up to debate. Um, we've also had um, the, the reforms to shared ownership. And obviously, we're, we're still waiting for the outcome of the technical consultation on that. Um, I won't go through uh, the detail of that um, because I'm, I'm sure most of the people on the call today will be aware of that obviously quite wide ranging and, and placing more risk back back with the landlord um, in terms of some of those reforms proposed. Um, so again, you know, we're doing our modelling on that insofar as we're able to at the moment and, and having conversations as to whether we think that impacts um, the, the level of home ownership that we will be looking to deliver. And then obviously right to shared ownership as well, um, which is, I suppose, a great unknown. Um, our gut reaction has been to, to question whether the, the level of take up will be that great, um, given the lack of get discount, given what we saw with, with an old, um, the old social home buy programme. But um, only time will tell. Um, I think our, our assumptions will probably relatively minimal around the take up um, um, to start with, but it's something we're going to have to, to keep under close review. So I just wanted to touch on, on the proposed planning reforms. Um, I've tried to kind of summarise some of the biggest reforms um, since World War II on one slide, which is um, a bit of a challenge. I'm, I'm just going to focus because of time on, on some of those short term issues um, that I'm sure we'll all be talking about and, and certainly seeing in the press. Um, I think for, for us, the short term provision does give us um, the short term um, reforms, sorry, do give us some challenges um, around um, that the supply across our operating areas um, in terms of, you know, the, the raising the threshold above which developers must make those affordable housing contributions. And obviously, the NHF have set out that that could have an impact on supply of up to 20%. I think we're particularly concerned about that in some of our rural areas. And, and we also have ongoing relationships with some SMEs who actually deliver us really high quality products um, in, in some of our locations. And they may not be required to do that moving forward if that that threshold is raised from 10 to kind of 40 or 50 homes. 
Um, in terms of first homes, obviously there's, there's a way to go on um, the first homes agenda and it will be interesting to see what lenders um, say around this. But for us, I think there's definitely a concern around the impact on supply of, of homes for rent and particularly um, shared ownership with 25% of, of homes coming through planning gain being for shared ownership moving forwards. Um, and, you know, looking at some of the work Savills have done um, around first homes, um, you know, is that kind of diverting um, supply away from from the communities and and the people who really need it? My, you know, and I suspect that that is the case. Um, just in terms of my second point now, is it competition for shared ownership? I think some of the work Savills have done have shown that you know that there probably are some overlaps, as there have been with with um, Help to Buy. But on the whole, um, shared ownership still remains that more affordable product, and obviously we have those flexibilities around that first tranche share. So I'm hoping that that won't be too much of an issue. But I do think that the impact on supply is the bigger risk there. Um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, design and, and construction and quality and, and Mark's touched on on some of this um, but just to start with the construction market um, we're seeing a really challenging construction market in the northwest at present um, we have very sadly witnessed the demise of, of a number of contractors over the last year or so um, and that's had an impact on our, our procurement framework um, we've seen some substantial increases in construction costs and and at the same time we have found it quite challenging to get particularly some of those SMEs to work with us to tackle some of those smaller more challenging sites garage sites and and sites in some of those more outlying locations um, which I believe is kind of due to the availability of work in, in some of those more accessible locations. Um, I have to say, I do have a fair bit of sympathy with contractors, which is, is probably an unusual thing for me to say in fairness, but you know that the impact of COVID-19 on them has been significant despite the government allowing construction to continue. Um, and you know i understand insurance premiums for them in some instances have gone through the roof and that and that's being compounded by some of the um supply chain and labor issues of, of which we i'm sure we all talk about regularly so to some extent it is no surprise we're seeing what we're seeing in that respect but it does obviously put quite a lot of pressure on scheme viability um and then i, I couldn't not mention brexit but you know obviously that i think that the, it stands to have a further impact and compound some of those issues we're, we're already seeing moving forward forward. Um, in terms of that design and quality, you know, Mark has touched on the, the net zero agenda and the building safety. Um, you know, absolutely, you know, the, the right direction of travel, but comes at a cost. And as Mark said, you know, there's going to be some difficult decisions to make around um, uh, development programs and, um, you know, in terms of new, the cost of new supply, but also set in the context of um, addressing our existing stock moving forward. Um, you know, for us, we've got, you know, a real commitment to um, continuing to improve the, the design and quality of our homes and um, to make sure that they are truly sustainable moving forward, that we're not retrofitting in five or ten years time. Um, and I guess one of the other challenges we, we've got to help support that is scaling up of, of modern methods of construction and starting to realise some of those efficiencies required for, for this approach to work at its best. And um, so, so just to conclude, really, how, how are we responding to some of those challenges? Um, and I just wanted to very briefly touch on, on some of um, my thoughts on that before we hand over and have the, the panel discussion. Just going back to the new shared ownership product, obviously, we are in a bit of limbo at the moment until we have those final details. Um, but I think for me, you know, soon we will we'll know where we stand with that. We'll be able to conclude our, our modelling and business planning. But we've got to start looking forward then. And I think one of the biggest risks for me lies in that successful transition and implementation of the product within our organizations and, and with our customers and being extremely clear about what this new product looks like and, and to avoid um, miscommunication and perhaps overinflating customer expectations, particularly around um, those repair and maintenance responsibilities. Um, just on, on that second point there, um, going, you know, as an organisation kind of relatively new to development at the moment, we've Vales only delivering homes for, for rent and, and shared ownership and we have an aspiration to, to further diversify that. Um, we're reviewing the, the timing of that 
realising that aspiration at the moment. Um, but we are looking at implementing um, kind of rent to buy and so on moving forward, just touching back on, on some of what Alex was saying around, you know, first time buyers now starting to be priced out of the market. And we are seeing an impact um, around the shared ownership market as well and, and that lender market starting to contract. So to, to kind of spread our risk and, and to make sure that we've got a range of offers and we're meeting the needs of people who are kind of being priced out of that market at this point in time. Um, we're also kind of just revisiting um, our sensitivity analyses and, and having a clear exit strategy for, for sales schemes and um, for land banks, which is something we always have, but it's it's never felt like a more important time to to just sense check that and uh, we are absolutely seeing um, our executive and, and board starting to give that more um, in-depth in scrutiny as we present schemes for approval. Um, just in terms of, of, of my third point there around understanding our markets, it sounds so ridiculously simple, but actually, you know, I think it's quite a challenge, um, particularly in the context of what Mark was saying around resources being quite stretched in our sector. You know, many of us are covering kind of really wide operating areas and, and also some very nuanced markets. So I don't think the importance of this can be overstated when it comes to making informed decisions around investments. Um, we spend a lot of time on that as part of our approval process, working with consultants local authorities and um, our neighborhoods teams on the ground to build a really clear picture around supply and demand in an area so you know we, we're confident we've got those really quality investment opportunities um, we are looking at diversifying the procurement of our schemes. I've, I've talked a little bit about my concern around um, the proposed planning reforms and impact on supply through planning gain and, and also that design and quality agenda. Um, I think, you know, we work with some great developers, but also sometimes quality and in particular the size of homes is perhaps not where we would like it to be. Um, so we're looking now at, at kind of controlling our own destiny a bit more um, by delivering sites from start to, to finish. Um, I don't think that is the, the solution. Obviously, we want, we need affordable homes coming through that planning gain process. And I think, you know, the solution for me is absolutely making sure, um, you know, we're all delivering um, really good quality homes across the sector, regardless of, of our background and our motivations. And hopefully that is the, something the government can kind of help push forward. And then finally, in terms of that contractor market, um, we're listening to our contractor and consultant partners about how we, we might be able to do things differently. And in the context of our risk appetite, we acknowledge that it's a really challenging time. Um, as JV North, we'll be re-procuring our, our framework this year. So through that, we're having a lot of those conversations. Um, you know, I don't have any kind of pearls of wisdom to share right now, but you know, it, it's maybe one for a future a future session. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation. So I'm going to hand back to Chris and hopefully we, we can open that up into some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was fantastic. I really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm calling back uh, Mark and uh, Phil. And okay. So a lot, lot to think about there. A lot, you touched on Brexit, Joe. So the last time we spoke about Brexit, no one was bothered about Brexit. It was all about COVID. Uh, and again, I, I sort of had a bunch of sort of blank faces when I said Brexit. No one really was particularly bothered. Why, why do you think that was? Um, I, well, I think things have kind of overtaken a little bit, haven't they, in terms of, of COVID and some of the changes we've seen this year. Um, you know, I suppose there's a degree of reassurance around the fact that we now have a trade deal. Um, but I guess for me, I, I am not the Brexit expert. I do not read this in depth every day, but I can't see how it won't have an impact over the next few years as we transition to, to the new arrangements. And I think um, where there's uncertainty, you know, that, that is invariably kind of impacted across markets. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Oh, I have a question here. Um, do you expect the stamp duty holiday to be extended by beyond March? Uh, so we'll start with you, Mark. I think not. I mean, if you look at the graphs that um, Alex showed us at the beginning, I mean, if demand is is as strong as it as it appears to be and is increasing, then um, from a government point of view. I'm not sure that they will feel the need to underpin the market for a continued period. Um, I think that the issue is, you know, keeping an eye on that as you get up to 
uh, February, March time. And if things start dipping uh, as a result of the, the ongoing lockdown, depending on how, it, how long it goes for, they might reconsider that. But I think for the moment, they're not going to extend it. Okay. And is it something, I mean, it's only really benefiting the people on the ladder, isn't it? This is like the net result of the stamp duty uh, decrease. It's only people who are actually on the on the market who, who are moving around and the first time buyers are still in the same place they were. I mean, it's interesting if you look at it from the buy to let point of view, um, because obviously buy to let has decreased substantially in terms of tax efficiency and so on. But um, I mean, I'm working with local authorities who are, out, who are out there buying properties to use as temporary accommodation for homeless families. And now is a great time for them to buy because, the, because of the stamp duty holiday. So uh, for example, I was working with Haringey, uh, set up a company for them to, to deliver temporary accommodation. And um, they've been doing really, really good numbers getting, getting properties purchased uh, over the last few months. I wouldn't be entirely surprised if they did extend it a little bit further than March, only because mm. of the impact of increasing mobility in the housing market. Obviously, the more people are moving, the more there is available properties for people to move and buy, and that sort of shifts everyone along, which ultimately benefits the bottom end of the market as well, doesn't it, in the sense of the first-time buyers coming in. But given the house price um, inflation, possibly not. Um, I was talking to somebody, an economics guy recently, and they saying at the moment you know you've got all this money being pumped into the uh, economy because of covid which is not sharp not far off where we were with the debt from world war ii so it's a you know huge amount of money would be paying off for the next 50 years or so um but you're not seeing any inflation retail price inflation not seeing cpi is really low which is counterintuitive when you pump loads of money into the economy because you would expect inflation then to rise but what you are seeing is inflation on assets increasing and so you think if you go forward another year or so once you know you've got vaccinations in place and covid's kind of relaxed and people are getting back to normal you're going to have all these people in the retail sector and the hospitality sector going back into business trying to recoup some losses bring all their prices up and then suddenly you'll see this uplift in inflation in on cpr and retail rpi as well i think um, which yeah. will make life even more difficult for people next year because it will catch up, whereas this year, I think, as you say, it's it, it, I think it's, it's a quiet, calm before the storm, maybe, um, for lots of people in terms of affordability. Sorry to be depressing, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, uh, okay. I think we're open for a little while yet of, the, of uh, support, I think. Thank, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, the questions are pouring in now. Let's, uh, let's move on. I wonder if you could share what square meter cost you are experiencing. Um, I mean, we are starting to see, I mean, th th there's still a range up in the northwest, um, but I think that probably the lowest cost we're seeing now is is north of £1,600 a square metre. Um, it, there's a massive variation depending on th the size and nature of the site. Um, but I mean, we're seeing costs of kind of 1800 upwards for some more of those kind of challenging, complicated sites now, um, which is which is high for the Northwest. And, you know, that that's represented quite a significant jump in the last couple of years. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly working in London, so obviously the prices are a bit higher than that. Um, so e easily looking at two and a half K. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Phil, any any anything you're seeing on some of the appraisals you've been having a look at? Yeah, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything going up and at kind that kind of range as well on across the country as well. Yeah, easily dropped yeah. from yeah fifteen hundred to three thousand that kind of variation. I'd say. Okay, got another one here. Has anyone found funding issues as a result of lenders insisting on the EWS one surveys? on many slash all flocks. We've all heard about this. This is the post-Brexit, uh, sorry, not post-Brexit, post-Grenfell um, uh, issue, really, uh, where, uh, Mark, you, I think this is one for you, isn't it? Well, I certainly know uh, that it's had a massive impact. In terms of the specific question about lenders, um, what, what, what was the question asking? Uh, have lenders not has lent? Been? Has, yeah, basically, has anyone found any funding issues as a result of lenders insisting on EWS1 surveys uh, on all blocks? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of it mostly through individual uh, leaseholders who are having trouble remortgaging 
or, or moving, you know, selling and, and, and getting someone else to come in and buy because of those mortgage issues. Whether the question was really getting at from the development point of view, is development finance being constrained in this way? I think that might be the question. Um, and, and I don't have a personal experience of that. Okay. Okay, good no, to know. I think just from our point of view, we're, we're lucky, you know, we're not so impacted by that with, with the nature of the stock we have at the moment. So um, I, I'd struggle to give an answer on that one, I'm afraid. Not many blocks in Weaver Vale. Not so many, not so many. Has, yeah. Can low carbon homes be built to the same cost? If not, then where is the money going to come from to increase the design aspects? So we've been asked for much higher standards, much higher design aspect, and where's the money? Show me the money, basically. I mean, I think, you know, Homes England have set out their stall in terms of modern methods of construction and that they are willing to consider higher grant rates. So I think that there's a positive there in, in that, you know, there may be the opportunity to, to explore that. The great unknown, I guess, at the moment is, is how much more. And, um, you know, I guess until we really start having that conversation, it, it's going to be difficult to tell. What we're seeing at the moment, um, looking at, you know, towards that that net, that net zero um, new offer, that modular product is that those costs are higher again. Um, I think for me, you know, I want to have a look at the way we appraise as well, um, because, you know, some of those assumptions around repairs and maintenance and so on, you know, there may be some flexibility for us to, to um, consider that depending on the, the quality of that product we deliver. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I'm kind of interested to, to see what comes from the Homes England position in those grant rates. Thank you. Mark, anything on that from you? I mean, I just think that zero carbon is going to cost everybody more, um, at, certainly in terms of capital expenditure. I don't think anyone is suggesting that there's a way around that. Um, and, you know, the, the issue is the, the big picture in terms of whole life costing and, and the externalities, to use the economic term, about the impact in the wider market. So the fact is our residents are going to have lower bills to pay if we invest in insulating their homes. Um, they're the beneficiaries and you know we as a landlord aren't um so you know we have to make a commitment to deliver that for them and maybe in the long term that's reflected in in other ways financially but it, you know it's 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 more than just a commercial equation isn't it it's it's and, and if you think about climate change and the impact on the whole of society then you know this it's a it's a just a different order of, of magnitude in terms of making that decision it's not just about the bottom line on a particular development scheme thank yeah. you Mark. Well, i think it will, be, it will be cheaper won't it in mc i mean the part part of the, the thing around mc is it was meant to be it's, it works at scale and we're not got scale so it's expensive but once you get enough buy-in and this might program might be enough to provide the kickstart for that and hopefully although it will be cheaper for tenants clearly and purchasers it should also be cheaper on the same in maintenance for the housing association in terms of the quality of the build as well shouldn't it so hopefully it'll yeah. hopefully it'll keep going <laughs> once i put some like you say once I put the grant to it yeah thank you uh we're moving on has any of the panel had any experience of the first homes proposition is it having any effect I mean, I think it's, you know, it's too early to, to tell at the moment. As I said in my presentation, you know, I do have a concern around um, first homes kind of coming in in our area and um, the, the reduction in supply, particularly around the shared ownership product. Um, but yeah, I still think that there's a bit more work to be done on understanding what that looks like and, and you know, the buying of the lender market and so on before we can um, really start to evaluate it. You, I guess Martin. from my point of view, the if you if you look at what happened with starter homes as a concept, and you know all of the time and energy spent discussing how that might work and evaluating that and putting it into all our models, and then and then eventually, obviously, I think for all the right reasons, it was dropped, and and now you know we have something else that maybe is the the same idea in another guise. Uh, I just I would always be concerned that we're going to waste time. Uh, working our way through something that never happens. 
Uh, but I'm afraid that's the nature of, uh, of what we all do. Yeah. And Phil, have you had anything on the first homes proposition? Any, any, any? Nothing specific. No, nothing more than what's been discussed now. Right. So we're going back to this is again back to the 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 the, the result of the EWS one. Mark, is, is there, as far as you're aware, have the has this affected the the flat sales market? Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, if you look at areas where, for example, I worked in Tower Hamlets um, and there were huge numbers of buildings affected and uh, there were a lot of people who were telling us as a local authority that they weren't able to, to move house. They weren't able to sell their properties because of the impact uh, of the uncertainty and, and um, you know, the, the building owners and the managing agents weren't responding quickly enough. Uh, so sales were falling through. Um, and so it's definitely had an impact. And um, I think um, what's interesting at the moment, in, I mean, just on the news yesterday, there was um, a suggestion that there are significant numbers of people moving out of London. Now, whether that's a temporary or a longer term trend, who knows? I mean, personally, I think it's probably, you know, going to be a, a blip. It's probably going to be short lived. But all of that is is creating that sense of, uh, there, there just aren't enough people in London looking to purchase and then struggling to to find a, a way of getting a loan on, on a high rise building. Well, they're, they're just going to try and live slightly further out in a in a low rise property. Leasehold, this all really ties into leasehold had a really bad year last year, didn't it? We had the increasing rents on the shared ownership, which was hitting LBC constantly. Uh, we had all the, the paneling, all the cladding. We had the, the leasehold, the service bill, the services being sold off to other companies who were great, grossly inflating them. Leasehold has taken quite a pounding and doesn't really have a huge amount of trust at the moment. Uh, because of all of these things compounding together in a perfect storm to sort of take down these holders, certainly had an impact on people's view of shared ownership. Uh, how is that going to change this year? Are we going to see that, has that affected shared ownership sales? Are people less wary? Or is it the fact that supply is so strong and demand is so weak, people will do what they have to do? Yeah, I mean, I think in our neck of the woods, um, we tend not to suffer too much and um, because of that you know you absolutely have your leasehold and, and shared ownership skeptics um but who, who tend not to kind of even reach us really um i do think you know through panorama documentary and and some of the headlines you're seeing in the press there's there's an awareness now isn't there that that maybe didn't exist before um around leasehold and i think shared ownership can get quite unfairly caught up in that um I mean, I suppose some of the reforms proposed to the product are an attempt to, to address some of those issues um, that, that people kind of are reporting with shared ownership. Um, so I would hope that, you know, some of those reforms do help um, improve that reputation. And I think just going back to what I said in my presentation, I think the key there is is to really get that offer very clear and, and communicated well to customers um, to, to see it be successful. I think you know, the other thing we've started to look at is, is the length of lease. Um, that, that we sell um, and, and whether we extend that to, to just give our purchases a little bit more security of tenure. Mark, any anything to add on um, the, the fate think, of leasehold? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to, to limited choices, doesn't it? So for a lot of people, they really don't have much option other than to, to go for a leasehold property. And um, I just think the majority of people don't understand the product. They don't understand the law. And um, I suspect that, that lawyers, when conveyancing and, and you know, doing all of that um, process of advising people, um, really don't spend enough time explaining to people what, what the liability is they're getting into and, and um, what the constraints are around that. Yeah, I would agree. I think as well the proposed talk about regulating management companies private management companies as well would go a long way to sort of providing some reassurance that people aren't suddenly going to get caught out with massive management costs going you know spiraling um, you know with no no way of 
rolled a course to deal with it. So yeah. that'll be interesting to see if that comes up. Okay, well, you know, we're approaching 11 o'clock. Uh, the, the, we have pretty much gone through the questions. I feel like we've had a pretty good discussion. I, we've covered a lot of ground in, in, in a short period of time. Uh, which is how we like to do these things. Uh, so I'm going to um, sign off. I'm going to thank Joe and Mark. Thank you so much. And of course, Alex, who was here before. Uh, we really appreciate what you brought to the table today. Phil, thank you again so much for, for coming and, and sharing the, the company 2021 vision with us. Uh, if anyone wants to talk to us more about cloud, please reach out to me or my colleague, Ricky Prota. Uh, we're both new business managers and uh, we, we love talking to you and hearing from you. And of course, uh, helping you in all of these ways. So thank you everyone. And uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Look out for the next webinar. It will be upcoming. Okay, and everyone have a great week. You too. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, 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 Bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye.